Here's the deep problem of free will. On the one hand, our human sense is that our actions are fully free. On the other hand, our scientific sense is that every action is determined by a prior action. What is free will? Do we have free will? That's the big question. Free will is such a big question that the John Templeton Foundation has funded a multi-year study with experts in science, philosophy, and theology. The project is called Big Questions in Free Will. It has 60 participants, four conferences, numerous experiments and papers, all to research, test, discuss, and debate free will. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth follows the project, asking the big questions in free will. My goal as a research psychologist is to figure out what happens inside the mind and so forth that produces the behavior. I got into studying free will by virtue of my research on self-control. Self-control is difficult, so it depletes uh, some energy, and after that, you're not as good at self-control until you, you replenish. Uh, when we found that the same energy is also used for decision-making and initiative, and I said, okay, well, this is bigger than self-control, that's when we started talking about free will. Common theme. Roy is conducting two kinds of experiments on free will. The first examines beliefs about free will and how they can change. Robert, this is uh, Michael Ent. He's a PhD nice student in our you. laboratory. Looking forward to the experiment. Okay. Yes. This was all his idea. He came up with the idea that we could uh, manipulate people's beliefs about free will by uh, manipulating their body's uh, states. Oh. Okay, so there's two conditions. Uh, participants in one condition, they demonstrate a voluntary response. So they bounce the ball in one hand and catch it in the other. They get the feeling of deliberately, consciously controlling their bodies, and that should increase their belief in free will because it, it calls attention to uh, how they mentally control about their actions. And then participants in the other condition, um, they have their involuntary reflexes triggered. So I blow a puff of air into their eyes, and then I shine a light to you know, stimulate their pupillary reflexes. Right, right. That's not something you use free will for. It's a, an automatic response. That should kind of cue you into the idea that your body works like a robot and that you don't have free will. Okay, so now I'm just going to have you complete this questionnaire about your beliefs and attitudes, and I'll come back in a Roy's bit. theory proves to be correct. Subjects who perform voluntary actions report a stronger belief in free will, while subjects whose involuntary reflexes were triggered report a weaker belief. The important idea here is that beliefs about free will are, are flexible, are malleable, subject to cues even coming uh, inside ourselves. And perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that the philosophers who have been debating this for, uh, for centuries haven't reached a decision yet, because even each person's own beliefs might change. So uh, you know, what we might think of as a medical, physical opinion in this uh, very abstract way is in fact something that's influenced by cues coming from inside our bodies, uh, and it can go up or down. Next, Roy investigates the individual psychology of free will, asking whether our capacity to exercise free will can change. In Roy's theory, making free will decisions takes energy. And since bodily energy is finite, the more decisions we make, the less free will we have. Roy and his assistant show me the experiment. First, we have people make a variety of decisions. Okay. This first task is a, is a choice task. So there's a variety of products on the screen, and I'll ask you to make choices between the two products, one on each side. And then we bring them over to the ice bath, and we put their hand in the ice water and see how long they can take it, both how long they wait until they can actually feel pain, and then also uh, how long they can last total. When you feel pain at first, say now, and when you can't bear the pain any longer, uh, remove your hand and, and say stop. Now. Stop. All right. To determine how prior choices affect subjects' willpower, Roy repeats this experiment, but with one crucial difference. Subjects view the same products, but now do not choose between them. This is the control. People in the control condition tend to last about a minute uh -huh. on average, uh -huh. 
And after making choices, they only last about 45 seconds. That's a big difference if you think about it. It is. Yeah. So willpower is like a kind of muscle, exhausted by repetition. The more we use it, the harder to continue to use it. This means that free will has biological constraints. Is this a new kind of free will? Philosophers have been debating for centuries, yes or no, do people have free will or not? We should stop trying to give a yes or no answer to what people say free will and instead say, how hard is it or how much does it take for this person to exert free action? What are the things that will make free action easier? What are the things that will impede free action? All right, that's it. For Roy, psychology shows the working complexity of free will, how we view it, how we exercise it, and what our capacity is for free action. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.